So we're very pleased that Brian Ballinger has saved the day and stepped in at such short notice. So you may know Brian, he's a retired medical practitioner as a consultant psychiatrist, and he divides his time between Dundee and Easter Ross. Brian has taken an interest in natural history for many years, and for the past 19 years, he has been the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland's recorder for Easter Ross. Brian has also been vice president and president of the Botanical Society of Scotland, is a long time member of the council and is the local secretary for Dundee. So I'm pleased to welcome Brian Ballinger to give us uh, a talk this evening. Over to you, Brian. Thank you, well, thanks for coming. Well, about 25 years ago, my late wife and I decided to look for a bit of land to manage, to enjoy. Why we did this, it's difficult to give a rational explanation. We're not alone in this, but, but we certainly set out, but, it turns out we didn't just get one bit of land, we ended up with four for some reason. So here they are, and they're widely scattered. There's Brownie Wood in Fife, Dam Pond in Angus, which I no longer own, Garrick Wood in Easter Ross, and the distant Tarrow Wood in Caithness. And I'm going to talk about them in order. Brownie Wood in North Fife is by Goldry, 25 acres. It was part of an estate that was wanting to raise some extra money and they sold off lots of bits and we bought this one. It's an old mixed plantation and you see that ride there, it's a very typical bit of it with um, mixed conifers and broad leaves uh, and so on. And here it is, uh, it's by Goldry, quite near the Tay, overlooking the Tay, uh, by Gallo Hill, there's so many Gallows Hills in this, in this world and we'll come back to a Gallo Hill again. And how long has it been there? Well, the Roy map of the 18th century is the oldest map really that shows woodlands in Scotland, ancient woodlands. And with a bit of imagination, I might just be able to see it there up above gallery as they call it then, but you know, a bit of imagination required. But certainly by the 19th century, it was, it was here, clearly established on the 19th century ordnance survey map. And here it is, <clears throat> it's on the skyline from Dundee. Well, when you get these woods, you don't realize you're not just getting a wood, you get a landscape responsibility. And of course, if you start mucking around with it, people get upset. And here it is again, overlooking the Tay, Road, the Tay Rail Bridge uh, and in a very sort of key position uh, on the top of the hill. Of course, it does catch the wind. And this is the bottom of it, um, the gate I own up to the road here. And uh, very fine views all round over the Tay and to Dundee here, this is looking north. And we have this oak tree. Now, you see, we also have a power line. It's not always a good thing to have a power line. Okay, they may pay you a bit of way leave, but we, we had to fight to defend this oak tree from being chopped down, poor thing. The, the, the electricity people come and chop down other trees, the cherries in flower here from time to time, but uh, it, it does help to keep this bit of the wood clear. So that's, that's the pylon. And this is from the other end of the wood, looking again towards Dundee, this is more to the east. And my neighbor here, this guy has a big farm and he's making gas from rotting material. So a biomass plant and his water supply is in my wood here. And I, I let him take a couple of ash trees out, which he needed to for his maintenance to, to turn into gas. So there's a bit of gas coming through. It's not just, uh, you, you know, from fossil fuels and it's not much, I don't think. And here's the other edge of the wood, uh, again, looking uh, northwest. And it's got a beach edge to it. Um, so many five woods have got beaches on the edge. And it's got a lot of sycamore and it's got a lot of regenerating beach. Now, sycamore above all, and beach to a great extent, love this wood. Okay, well, they're not truly native up here, but my heart has warmed a bit towards sycamore. Uh, because all the other trees seem to be catching diseases. But there are lots of other trees in this wood, cherry laurel, which points to it being a, a so-called sporting wood. It had pheasant shooting. That's really what kept it as a wood, actually, to many, many to a well, We did have a pheasant pen in the wood when we first got it, but um, I, we did dis discontinue it because it was making an awful mess. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, so we stopped that. Lots of holly rarely produces berries for some reason. Birch, which regenerates, just birch brackets on here, and a 
woodpecker hole here and rowan and lots of other things. I've never seen a wood with as much honeysuckle in. It's wonderful, this all up all the trees along the ground, wonderful stuff. Not every forester's friend. Foresters are not always very keen on honeysuckle, but I like it. And we do have some bluebells, wild hyacinths, which are mainly native, one-sided narrow bell, but at the one end of the wood, there is some Spanish infiltration, the dreaded hybrid Spanish bluebell, and I do ethnic cleansing every year to remove as many of the of the hybrids, poor things, you know, I shouldn't do it really, uh, as I can. And th this is an orange tip butterfly. It hasn't got orange tips because it's female, but orange tip butterflies have moved in in recent years, and now commas have as well, of course, common butterfly. Lots of other fairly common wildlife flowers in, in the wood in spring coming out now. Uh, Picaria verna, formerly known as Picaria, uh, and um, Oxalis is said to sell the wood sorrel, which loves the wood, it spreads right through it. Uh, dog violet, um, which is very common in the wood. A bit less common is the um, Enchanter's Nightshade, to say the Tetiana, in a few places. This, bless it, flowers a bit later than the other flowers in the woods, so it's a bonus later in the year, and it's, it's the species, not the hybrid, there's a hybrid of it with, with another to say, species, which is equally common actually. And other things, the, 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 the digitalis purpurea, foxgloves, they, they grow profusely when there's been some tree felling. Green alconet, which is neither, which is not green, of course, just to confuse us, uh, not a native, but that is does very well in the wood. Tuberous comfrey, a lot of it at the bottom of the wood, and Stachys sylvatica, uh, which has the very smelly leaves, but we have various, and lots of other things too. This, I'm not so keen on. This is the white butterbur. It wasn't there when we bought the wood, and it came in, I have a horrible feeling, it came on our boots. Um, it's it's non-native, actually it flowers early, it's rather attractive, isn't it? But it's, um, it is a bit invasive, and um, certainly in Easter Ross, where I record it, it's now commoner than, than the common butterbur, uh, Petocytes, uh, this is Petocytes, Petocytes albus. So um, I do push it back a bit, trying to stop it conquering the other side of the path. When we bought the wood, there's a quarry in the middle of the wood, and it's been used as a farm dump, which is so typical, and a huge mass of agricultural stuff, which we laboriously took to the road half a mile away and to the tip. Uh, it strikes me now, we probably threw away some historic agricultural equipment. But there's one, um, there's one uh, lid of a tractor, which I haven't managed to shift, but that uh, is going to stay forever, I think. The wood is mainly on andesite. This is the volcanic rock with lots of air holes in it. But down the bottom, it's on the sandstone because Fife and Dundee has, has sandstone with uh, volcanic intrusions. This is a seasonal pond in the old quarry, which gets taken over by Calitrichi, water starwort. I hesitate to put a species name on it. Calitrichi is difficult. Frogs sometimes spawn in it, uh, but then they get caught out because it's a very seasonal pond and dries up. Lots of fungi, I just mentioned this one, the uh, stinkhorn, which produces this smell, which, produce, which brings all the male flies to gather on its head, think it's a female fly. And oh dear, it's not. They just carry spores away. Squirrels, we have red and gray squirrels in here. It's on the battle line, the front line between the advance of the gray and the fight back of the red. Some of the neighbors do actually cull the grays. Uh, I haven't seen as many squirrels of either species lately. I don't quite know why, but uh, you know, it's lovely to have them. I haven't got a decent photo of a squirrel, I'm afraid, to show from the wood. And we have badgers. Um, an old badger set on the slope going down. Uh, I, I do, I'm slightly careful how many I mentioned people do this too, because it's um, there is badger baiting in Fife, but I, uh, I do mention it to locals and I mention it to responsible naturalists like you good folks. Uh, but um, it, it's a typical badger set on soft ground on a hill. And we're, we're home for ladybirds um, in the winter on the top here. We, um, we have great gatherings of ladybirds in their, their, winter, their, their winter sort of social event when they all gather together. These are mainly seven spots, but we get other species too. 
this talk is not all about um, plants, by the way, though it's a botanical society talk. We um, have done bits of work. This is my late wife, who used to enjoy using a chainsaw. And for a long time, we were taking out sycamore. Uh, I've given up on that, actually, because I've warmed a bit towards sycamore. And it does proliferate in the wood. And uh, I don't use a chainsaw. I don't like them. Gave them away, actually. And we have a lot of liaison with the local schools and they, they with help from others, that they help put up bird boxes but with the aid of the Fife Countryside Ranger. There are lots of bird boxes. People come and looking at them and looking at what's nesting in them every year. Um, it's used by the locals a lot, this wood. Uh, the kids play here, set up hides. One thing I'm not so keen on is when they set up tree houses, which uh, I always worry they're going to fall out and swing. I never gave anyone permission to have barbecues in the wood. In fact, I'm a bit cautious because of setting fire to the place with pine. But they have set one up. And it's not where I would have chosen, but it, it, it is actually safe enough. So I just let that pass. The locals are very interested. There's a lady who looks after the top path and takes a very active interest and put up this notice last year telling people not to ride motorbikes. I've never seen any evidence for motorbike in my wood. But nevertheless, perhaps if anyone thought of it, they would come and see this notice and go away. Dumping is an issue with sites like this sometimes. I have never had serious dumping, touch wood, I'm touching my desk now, uh, but I've had garden waste dumped at the entrance, which with a bit of labor you can disperse, but uh, what I don't, uh, the dreadful thing is when you get electrical stuff and so on, hazard of being anywhere in the country, I'm afraid. And the wind, this, this wood is on a hill, on the top of a hill, 100 mile an hour gales come roaring down the Tay. I've always had some wind blow. This was two years ago, and this was about the same actually, uh, the, the pines, but um, this last year, <laughs> Storm Harwin, in common with many other woods, caught it, but only really the bottom part, the top of the wood, which was mainly the one the locals walk in, survived all right. And the wood had edge with the broad leaves on, it's completely unscathed, this is just inside. This, this, um, this uh, gale came from this unusual northeast direction and caught this and many other woodlands of the area off guard. So there's been a lot of damage. This wood actually is not as badly affected as others. A friend is about to come and chop this lot for me and open the path again. That's one. Number two, Dam Pond. I no longer own it. I'm sorry to say I, I, I let it go with regret, but the family didn't want to inherit it. It needs keeping an eye on, and they live some way off. But because it's um, near Dundee, it's, it's an old mill pond. It's quite small. It's, it's only an acre. This was the first thing we bought, well, first one we bought, actually. And uh, a small burn runs through it. Here it is, this little blue thing here, Teeling, and the road to Forth was here, Dundee's now. It's five miles from Dundee. And here it is. Um, this, pond of about an acre, under another gallow hill, gallow hill up there, so a lot of hanging going on in this area, and willow, sycamore in leaf, and ash trees not in leaf yet. And here we are again, this ash tree is not looking very happy, and in fact it's got lesions on the trunk, so ash dieback has arrived, I'm afraid, as we've probably seen in many places, so um, unhappy ash, uh, and we'll see what happens. And there is willow, probably white willow here, which is invading the pond slowly as of these reeds, which were introduced here. Uh, so it is beginning to slowly silt up, which is quite good for wildlife actually, but um, uh, not very good. When it was first advertised, it was advertised as possible small boating. Well, <laughs> nobody else wanted to buy it, so we bought it. Loved by the birds. The these are the boss birds. The coots are very bossy and noisy and, and uh, and dominate the place, but more hens nest quietly in the corner. Tufted ducks are here quite a lot. Swans visit a lot, but they no longer nest here. I think we're deterred by the fact that they don't have quite as long a takeoff runway as they used to. Quite a lot of reasonably common plants, knapweed, this is here, and scabious, field scabious, red campion. I love red campion. It, some people think it's a weed, but it, it flowers throughout the year nearly. I mean, in Brownie Wood, I didn't show it there. There's lots of it in Brownie Wood where it flowers. You can see it in flower in many months of the year. 
and um and then sweet sicily it's an alien but it has this sanity sort of smell of the leaf and umbellifer so it's uh, i quite like it here and this um it is the tongue or tephrina only on older in the wood now people are not very familiar with this until the highland biological recording group in the north were reporting it from the by the rally service station and uh, we started looking for it it's really quite common in this fungus gall uh, this tephrina alni uh which is quite a funny looking little thing isn't it? and then there are various uh insects and animals now i labeled this baby frogs somebody told me that it might they might well be baby toads so i took the label off i'm not very good at identifying tiny amphibians so uh, anyway baby something about this toad short frogs common carpet moth you often find damselflies ringlets probably the commonest butterfly here and when we owned this wood when Bala was alive uh, we did actually do quite a lot of management of it uh so we, we we mowed some of the meadow some of it we left some we did twice a year and some once a year we had sort of rotor of treatment i'm afraid since my wife died 10 years ago <clears throat> i being a slightly lazier member of the family and sort of stopped and just let it become wilder uh, when you've got water coming through there are always potential problems so um the inflow uh, packed up at one stage because it comes under land dry, a land drain under farmers fields up north of it and that got blocked it took part of the farmer a long time to unblock it he said he's going to charge them he never did i'm not sure it's my job to pay him anyway uh, and then of course when you get these heavy storms the uh, things begin to flood and we certainly flooded the road on one or two occasions and the road people rang me up and said, well, we're going to get the JCB and knock the edge out of this pond. But I went with them to the site and we found that there is actually a big overflow pipe and it was just blocked by debris. So off it went. And then people down the hill were accusing the, the road people of opening the sluice on flooding down there where they haven't got very adequate precautions. Uh, but I, um, I later established that there was no, the sluice doesn't work, hasn't worked for years. And it was a lot of nonsense. But um, the joys of having a, a water running through, you know, it can uh, either be too much or too little. I got a man to rejig the outflow pipe and he started and then he, he left his digger there and left for five months. I thought I'd want a digger. Anyway, he finally, um, he finally finished and we'll have a nice new pipe. Uh, and again, the issue of the water inflow. Sometimes the guy up the hill is using more fertilizer I get this great overgrowth of algae. But most of the time, I have this nice pondweed, curled pondweed potted weed on Christmas all over the place. So it, I must say, it doesn't happen very often like that, it's more often like this. And this is a glyceria grass. Here. And then we get dumping again, it's on the road. So this is some builder's rubbish, that's a tire. The worst dumping was at the sofa which the, 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 the pond's got a very soft bottom. It's really difficult to work in. It, it's two, two meters deep in the middle. Uh, but we went in with waders and chopped it up with a hacksaw. But I was so cross, I forgot to take a photograph. Sort of thing you wish you'd taken a photograph of, but I didn't, I'm afraid. Uh, and other things dumped here have included three terrapins, which people have as pets. We did actually, we managed to get some people to take them off us, but. It's not easy to get rid of terrapins. The SSPCA certainly don't want them. So somebody decided our oh, pond would be a nice place to put them. And you don't want terrapins. And they survive here because they're North American. Uh, and they eat everything. Uh, but they finally came to grief. One got its, its, its foot caught in a bird slide. Another one had a hole in its shell, probably from a heron, I think. And the third just disappeared. And then we got two poor little rabbits, a black one and a white one. The black one buzzed off and probably joined its wild friends. The white one was not very well, I'm afraid. We took it to the SSPCA and it, they thought it had myxomatosis and they put the poor thing down. But it's not nice dumping your pets on like that. So, but I, I sold it two years ago to a guy who's got this small holding here who keeps our packers. Uh, and he's put up a new sign. It is dangerous. People, somebody, 
I think Drown had committed suicide in here some years ago. People say it was it's haunted. I've never seen a ghost. But anyway, he put up his new sign, Danger Deep Water. Uh, uh, but he hasn't put his alpacas in here. They might fall in the pond, actually, mind me. Uh, so that's number three, no longer owned. Regret, you know, I regret losing it. Really. Tara Woods. Now, this is the one that's way up north, near Wick. And it's big. It was in two sections, a good half mile apart, uh, 80 acres and 40 acres. I sold south section two years ago, and I'm in the process of negotiating a sale of north because I'm beginning to get a bit old for going all up there all the time. And if you, if you own a wood, you've really got to visit it regularly. And it's a sort of conifer plantation, the spruce and lodgepole pine. It should not have been put there. It's not flow country. It, it's rather more basic soil than flow country. With, not very basic, but slightly more. Uh, but it's still um, more land. And uh, I, I feel it probably shouldn't be put. But we, we own that half of this north section. And this section along the Wick River, we did own. This is it from a zoo, from a drone. My neighbor here has set up a small holding, uh, setting up a croft actually, built, building a house and running a, a wood business. And he's the guy that bought Tunnel South, uh, which is good. Uh, and um, he is one of the two people who are buying sections of Tunnel North, most of which I own that bit. This has been clear fell, this section in between because a pipeline went through, not by lot. This wood has a burner windlass running through it, uh, which is half a mile through the wood. And it's a wonderful flowery place. You see lots of meadow sweet and, and uh, lesser spearwort and all sorts of things, lots of grasses and, and so on. And uh, irises, um, it's lovely. Uh, and I'm the proud owner of two shooting towers. I have never climbed up one of them. But here's my granddaughter, age 20, who's just hopping up without any trouble at all. But I, I never felt secure going up. Not that I shoot, uh, but I do have deer. But they might grazing. You need you want some grazing. So uh, you know, sort of road deer. Um, and this is lock of windless, which I don't own. But this is triple SI, which is immediately adjacent to my wood. Uh, but I don't own it. I'm pleased to say, actually, it's complicated owning a triple SI, bound by all sorts of regulations. But it, it's rich in sedges. Um, Car express a carrier. That is sedge. Uh, is uh, it was a new vice county record for Cape Best when we found it, the most northerly site in Britain. Unfortunately, somebody has found it nearby, just slightly further north. So it's lost, it lost that distinction, that fame, claim to fame. Bottle sedge, Carotrostratus, is much more common. Uh, it's common in many places, really. And greater tussock sedge, Carotrostratus, is not all that common. There's masses of it along the Bernard Windows. Uh, Masses of and white sedge, carex curta, lots of that. And then also unusually up here anyway, is the, is the uh, lemna trisulca, uh, I believe duckweed, which um, is not a very good photograph, I'm afraid. It's the best I had, and I, it's, it's a scramble to get to it. <laughs> Couldn't come back to it. Uh, but it's um, it's it is, it, it's, it's it's very rare up here. This is the distribution of lemna trisulca. The duckweed in uh, in the UK, and you see this. I believe duckweed is quite frequent in England, but it sort of runs out here, and that is the site of this one and the adjacent site. Again, somebody has found it marginally further north than Tarrow Wood, but it, it was um, it was the most northerly site. Excuse me, I'm just going to have to. Hello. Yeah, I'm carrying it back though. I'm busy. I'm not giving it all. Sorry about that, folks. Um, the uh, so it's uh, lost that distinction. Uh, so um, the um, it, it, the lodgepole pine in this wood is not doing well. Uh, it's um. It's dying in the middle. And this is this is probably Dothstroma, almost certainly Dothstroma, the, the needle blight, which is afflicting large form in particular, but other pines as well. So sections of this are now dying. On the edge, it proliferates very well. I mean, it likes it here, basically, but um, it, it's um, 
it is dying down. And on the edge, there's some more dead lodge poles. And you don't expect this actually with lots of charm. It normally takes to get to the middle of the wood, but um, here it's getting the edge. So um, I don't quite know why that is. The, in this other Clearfeld section, the, um, the neighbor who's bought it was told by Forestry Commission to replant. And he planted about a thousand trees and they all died of pine weevil. So whether pine weevil is a factor here, but it doesn't usually attack, attack older trees. So I don't know anyway, they've died up on the edge. And um, the, 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 the areas of, uh, of uh, willow here, uh, the, the, the pollen studies in Lock of Windless do suggest the original woodland here was never dense, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago, but willow and birch were scattered. It's a very open landscape, basically. Some other plants, uh, some aquaticus, uh, marsh ragwort, Calthopolustris, and Stachys palatipus, so that it, Stachys palustris. So um, there, there are quite a lot of, quite a variety of plants in Trotel North. And lots of medical gale, bog myrtle, this wonderful thing that, that's got a, a, a smell that deters midges, allegedly. But there's lots of that on the rides. And orchids. Um, this is Dactylizer maculata, the heat spotted orchid, and northern marsh orchid. These are two of the commonest Scottish orchids in the north, at least. Uh, there's also less a twig blade in here, but, um, uh, but, but they are they're nice shows of them in this wood. And, uh, and uh, bog asphodel is. Um, it's, it's a wonderful plant. I think it's, it's the county plant of East of Ross, uh, Russia. Uh, and there's lots of it in this, in this wood here. It again, oh, that's very beautiful. And the, um, the, the, the Eriophyllum vaginatum, the, the cotton grass, the hare's tail cotton grass, this, this is it coming into bud and flower. It always puzzles people, this, this thing. But then when it comes typical cotton grass, rather tufted, it um, shows what it is. Slime moles, these mysterious things that um, sort of move around. I can't identify them, I'm sorry to say. They're these species, uh, somebody might know what they are, but they're really beautiful and strange. And then there are these holes with areas of chewed grass. This is water bowl signs. Never seen a water bowl in here, but the, the water bowls, um, uh, are present in some quantity. They've done a survey of them when they've been the pipeline, and they're really very common here. The mink never got up here, so the water bowl survived, bless them. Quite a lot of butterflies. There's a shelter in the large, in the wide rides in this wood that does give some protection for insects, and actually they're more flying insects than in the surrounding heath for some reason. Large heath, common blue, meadow brown, red admiral. Day flying moths, say the gold bar, bar straw, barred red. Common heath, common heath is so common actually uh, in the uplands. Um, so um, quite a lot flying around and also quite a lot creeping around. These, these caterpillars um, are the uh, ruby, uh, the, the tiger, both tiger moths. And the emperor caterpillar, never saw the emperor butterfly in this wood, but you, you see the caterpillar much more than you, than you actually see, see the moth. Uh, but and the oak egger, but um, well, we never moth trapped in this wood, so I don't have a complete list. For a while, we were working in this wood uh, with my dear wife taking out some spruce seedlings to stop invading the area surrounding the burn, but I'm afraid we sort of gave up, uh, or I have given up. Hopping over the road in the railway line, half a mile south, is the other section that I sold two years ago. And this is um, a track down the bottom of it. Uh, and it's an old road, actually, it was the old road along. And it's, it was on the Wick River. It's on the Wick River where, where there are otters in the river here, probably eating the salmon because there's salmon fishing here. Uh, and I don't own the salmon rights, but the salmon fishermen kindly chop back my gorse to keep the edge clear, bless them. So I'll forgive them a lot. Uh, so, um, and over the other side here, there's Carex aquatilis water sedge, which is a nice one to have, and I don't have it. I didn't have it. So shame, it was never in my power pack. 
and lots of flowers on the on the river bank here, Valerian, um, St. Honim Nigrum and, um, and Meadow Street, a lot really flowery river bank. This is wind farm land. Um, the, um, the farmer just south of us has set up, got into wind farms, you know, good for him. Uh, that, uh, uh, I don't mind them too much. They're, they're geese flying over here. And actually there's an application in for a wind farm beyond the other section of Terrell Wood, which would have made a nice access road for Terrell North actually, possibly produce some income, but the family didn't want to inherit Terrell Wood. So I am passing it over. Uh, it's on the railway line, this wood. Unfortunately, the train never stops here. Dear old Beeching tried to axe this line to Wick, but he failed. He was turned down by public clamor. But, but they did close the station at Bilster. This is the station here. And a nice plant in Tarot South was the, the greatest sundew, Drosser Anglica, which is the rarer one, which is in the red data book. Although actually in Scottish upland, it's really quite common, nothing like as common as the round leaf sundew, an insectivorous plant with sticky leaves, of course. Um, so I did sell the this other section. I sold this one through an agent. Uh, that's Tarrell North, Tarrell South, sorry, the first bit south of the river, south of the railway line I sold. Uh, but John Clegg put the notice up on the north, which couldn't go to the south. Um, but I finally sold it to the local guy. And I'm just making a private deal with the local guys um, for the next sale, cutting out the middleman. So I'm saying goodbye. Uh, I haven't sold it yet, but I'm going to. This may be my final visit as owner of this wood. So I say goodbye to the burner windless. And it, it's a plantation woodland, but it's quite attractive and interesting. It's an interesting plant. So it's been great to have it. Uh, not totally logical. Finally, but not least, is Garrick Wood, which is <coughs> on the A9, which again we bought in 1998. <coughs> 86 acres, very big. Birch and pine with wet and dry heat and bog, scattered exotics. And it's adjacent to the Carl Rossi Triple SI. Uh, and here it is. Uh, this is it here. And um, very near Tain. And near Fern Station, well, I've got a flat here actually, which we bought just to give us a base nearby, a small flat. Um, <clears throat> and here's Fern Station where I've got the flat. Now I, I talked about this when I gave the talk on the, the floor of Easter Ross to the BSS three years ago. <clears throat> so I won't say more, but um, it's a it's very interesting site here. Actually, it's got, on a bunch, it's got common broom rake on it, <clears throat> which is well, well north of any other site for common broom rake. And it's got quite a lot of orchids in here. Common broom rake is, is um, parasitic, mainly on red clover here, I think. <clears throat> and um, I haven't got it to subspecies. I'm going to have to try to, because I see the new Room rave handbook sort of pushes them all into subspecies. So I'll have to get a referee to help with that one, I'm afraid. Anyway, here's the entrance to the A to the road off the A9, the Garrick Wood off the A9. This notice was put on by my neighbor, not, not me, but my neighbor who's bought Carrossi Wood, a local man, who's been, been very concerned by the evidence of <coughs> deer poaching that I hadn't seen, but of course, you're not meant to go shooting deer in other people's land. And um, he was shooting both reds and rows, which are both present. Uh, so he's put these notices up and put cameras in actually. He has now moved that notice further into the wood. I didn't like it right on the outside. <coughs> but um, <clears throat> I think certainly, uh, I think they might have stopped. Uh, the, um, there's a lot of pine in this wood. The origin of pine in this area is difficult. I mean, it was always thought to be a mixture of naked pine and some Austrian planted pine. Um, this, this wood was probably originally rough grazing with scattered trees uh, because it's, it's poorer quality land than the surrounding agricultural land. Uh, but um, I think the feeling now is that there isn't, wasn't as much Austrian pine brought in as people might have thought. The definition of what is and isn't ancient pine wood is a bit arbitrary. Some of the wood adjacent to the is labeled ancient pine wood. This isn't, but uh, it's, it's I don't know, I don't know, I can't say. And there lots of heather. Now this heather is dying back. Every few years, the, the heather beetle comes. Actually, then, then the heather recovers. It does actually knock the heather back a bit. And heather, nice it is, it can get a bit overwhelming sometimes. 
In the drier parts of the wood, <coughs> there's some bracken. It is another invasive native, but it doesn't invade too much here because the wood's mainly too wet. Quite a lot of birch, uh, downy birch mainly, <coughs> entirely of it. Next door to me is the Carbossi Triple SI <coughs> to the south, which is designated for um, pine, pine birch wood, uh, uh, wet and dry heath. Uh, very similar to my wood, actually. It's a very boggy wood down the bottom. I and mean, this is a, this path is flooded almost all the year, and the surrounding area is very boggy. Uh, and the sedges in here, that's star sedge, Carotecanata, and green ribbed sedge is very common in the wood. And uh, juniper, I said some junipers, but we had to propagate them a little bit by cuttings as well. And willows, the willows are a bit of a mixture. I've got the eared willow and then some hybrids that are difficult to define. And various exotics, how they got here, I don't know. There has been planting on this wood. It's, you know, it's been knocked around a bit. Uh, Western hemlock spruce, Suga heterophylla, which can be invasive, but it's staying to its little patch. It's not growing further. Serbian spruce, this is quite scarce, actually. It's very elegant, it's an alien, but uh, exotic. So, uh, but it, this is the most northerly site of it recorded, actually, but um, just a little patch of it, it does propagate. Sitka spruce, uh, which um, I'm not so keen on really. We have some remnants of it, but it does self propagate. I take out Sitka spruce, speedings, Sitka spruce seedlings. The BSBI discussing labeling Sitka spruce as an, an invasive species, which to some extent it is, but it's also a very important wood crop. So I'm not sure how the Forestry Commission will view that. <clears throat> and a noble fir, a patch of it, which self propagates in the far end. Very elegant tree, isn't it? It's, 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 it's not native, of course. Uh, introduced to that. And then there are these areas of heathy area, which the pine is generally gen slowly reconquering. I'm letting it get on with it, actually. Although, but, you know, for a while I did take some pine and birch out, but <clears throat> I'm letting it get on with it because um, there's this dilemma of how much you promote wood growth and how much you protect your heath. I don't know. Also, the element of how much I can do now, really. The bog, I do protect more. Occasionally, it gets invaded by pine. This, this is the biggest section of bog. There are other ones, too, which has got a, a, a mass of bog asphodel, as you can see, at this time of year. It's, it's very nice. Um, with And later in the year, the, 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 um, the, the other cotton grass, area from Ancastropolium, common cotton grass, good show. And also, it's got extra strata in the bottle sedge. <clears throat> and there are lots and lots of lichens and mosses. Uh, Brian Coppins kind of helped identify some of the lichens in this wood and also terra wood. Uh, and lots of mosses, sphagnum, bosh, bosh, lots of it. And a variety of fungi, there's just a few of them. We haven't identified them all. I did, there was evidence of people illegally collecting fungi commercially here, the um, scene at the gate with boxes, uh, and I don't like that, and I think it's illegal actually, I mean, you're allowed to collect small amounts of fungi but for personal use, but I think it, you need a landowner's permission, I think, for commercial collection. I think the camera sign might have put them off, I haven't seen evidence of that lately. And quite a selection of plants, the more common sundew is very common in this one, round leaf sundew. And, uh, and the Trinitate, this is now renamed La Semechia, a chickweed wintergreen, which is neither a chickweed nor a wintergreen, just to confuse us all, which is a primrose family. Lathalium sylvaticum, so a, a, a um, track, or a, a forestry track species. And stag's horn club moths, again, much seen on forestry tacks, some like Odium clavatum, the club moss. And this, we didn't find this until we'd owned the wood for a while, but this is Creeping Lady Stress's orchid, which I think is quite common in the wood, actually. It often lurks in, under, the, under the vegetation and only flowers intermittently. So it flowers later in the year than most other orchids. It's an elegant little thing, and it, um, it's common in this area. It's in many of the pine woods in this area. And blessed, it's got evergreen leaves, you can find it all year round, unlike the other orchids. This is the distribution map of, um, of creeping lady's tresses. You see, it's very concentrated in this little northeast corner of Scotland. Some of the other bits may have come with planted trees 
from Scotland actually. Why? It's something to do with climate and such like, but it's love for it's pine wood. And some other orchids, um, lesser tway blade. Again, we didn't find it for a while. It's very elusive, it's tiny and beautiful, but it's eminently missable. But it's in several places in the wood, it comes and goes, it feels like, of course. It's really quite widespread in the uplands and lowlands of Scotland. But you don't see it very often. I know people on the orchid course, it was said it was the one that people got most excited about. Um, and the more common um, northern marsh orchid that we saw before, and the heath spotted orchid that we saw before. This is the common wood ant, which lives in the wood. It's sort of moved last year. And uh, finding, finding I, I had badgers. Um, uh, they are on the on the on, on, on the screen. Um, they, um, they 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 found uh, I found this, and it must be it must have been a badger made this uh, made this hole. Uh, must have been. And then the various insects we found and other invertebrates. Um, tiger beetles are common on the tracks. The speckled wood butterfly is the commonest butterfly in the wood, and in the wood, the um, spiders are very active, uh, and the painted lady butterfly is, is also found. We, we, we did moth trapping here for quite a while. Actually, my wife did the moth trap. We found quite a lot of moths, uh, long lists, uh, quite different from the ones we got at Fern Station. And um, they, uh, some of them, of course, imitate twigs, like buttered, and, and, and some of them imitate leaves, and some are just throw, throw, no, don't, they don't eat me sort of signs. This is a rather, a rather, rather less welcome invertebrate tick. Uh, this is the, um, the deer tick, which when you're working in these woods, you get them They're quite common. And of course, this is the danger sign uh, that um, you know, this ring is a danger sign and you need antibiotics. You put in a scrape pond, uh, which the water table is very high, so, so there's impermeable, there's an impermeable layer, so it just keeps it water. And the ducks appreciate it. And pond weeds just brought themselves here. It's a common pond weed, possibly done natans. So there are lots and lots of dragon and damselflies. This is a local, I get visits from local field groups to look at them and other things here. These are the larvae of the of the dragonflies. And these are some of them, island dart, a large red damsel, four spot chaser, emerald damselfly. They're eight species altogether. And the, and the guy came and looked at them last year and found the southern hawker, which is moving north. This it's a beautiful plant. I mean, it's everywhere in Scotland. It's very beautiful. It's, uh, it's one of these spring these shows we get in spring, isn't it? The gorse, which I know people don't always appreciate. These things like the dandelion show, people don't always appreciate, but it's, they're wonderful, really. But this is a bit invasive, and it invades my paths in this wood. And I spent a lot of time chopping away at gorse in the wood. So, you know, hold on, gorse. So that's about it, really. Uh, this is the Garrick wood in winter with a frozen pond. I call it the pond. The guy doing the dragonflies called it the Lockham. That's rather nice calling it the Lockham. So, has it been worth it? Yes, yes, it has. It's been great fun. Why did we do it? I'm not quite sure. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's been a wonderful thing owning these things. A privilege, really, and responsibility. You, you are responsible for looking after these places because they're not just yours, they're everybody's. So there we are. That's me. Thank you very much, everybody. Well, thank you very much, Brian. That was that was really interesting and beautiful to see such such lovely creatures in your woodland. It must be really sad to, to be giving them up now. And I'm glad that you've had many years of pleasure out of them. I'm keeping some of them. I'm keeping the other two. Keeping the other two. Well, that's good. Not for sale. That's not good. For sale. They're near my home, you know. So I'm keeping the other two. <laughs> yes, I was. I was wondering when you um, chose the woods. Was there a particular reason you chose those ones, or was it just they happened to be available at the time you were looking, or yeah. were the, did yeah. you choose them for such specific features when you were choosing? 
they happened to be available. I mean, I mean you know, they, they, there were things about them that attracted us, but uh, well, there were some others we didn't buy for various reasons, but uh, the, the, the woods, smallish woods had very limited availability at that time. And, um, you know, they're often big estates of a, you know, costing a million pounds and things. Now, there are people that buy woods and sell them in small packets of about five, 10 acres, which people buy, which is quite a good service in some ways. I mean, okay, they make a profit doing it, it's quite a lot per acre to buy them. But I know several people who bought these smaller woods, which for an amateur, you know, are probably quite good. It's what we probably would have done if we hadn't gone searching. I spent a lot of time just after I retired hunting for woods. So some others we nearly bought, but then didn't. Uh, and, um, and price was another factor, of course. You know. But uh, it, it was really availability was a big thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. D did you manage the trees? I know you said that you took out some seedlings of species that you didn't want to spread yeah. too much. But did you ever harvest any or thin or, or, we, we, we or did, take um, any money out of it that way? Brownie, with brownie wood, we got a woodland ground and we took out some spruce and, um, and we had to prove the access. The only woodland grant we had was that one in Brownie Wood, uh, which, uh, of course, the cost of having it done just about balanced the income you got from the wood. So I think we made about £10 at the end of the day. Otherwise, we, 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 we were taking big spruces out of Gary Wood. We didn't take them out, though, <clears throat> because I've never had a wood burning stove. And uh, I now just do light work. I, I manage. Um, I, you know, I, I, I keep the paths clear and I take out seedlings of things I don't like and, uh, and do some other things. But um, I'm not, uh, I, and I sometimes get people to do things, you know, big trees over paths. I get people. But generally, I'm generally letting them rip, you know, leave dead wood on the ground, which is a, a proof. I mean, now it's the approved thing to do. Yes. It's not dead wood, it's live wood, it's the recommendation, really. So. Yes, yeah, so I, I like the idea of, of, of letting nature take its course in, in lots of respects. I think often things are too much managed oh, yeah. um, and evolution doesn't, natural yeah. evolution doesn't occur quite so readily. Yeah. Um, so we have a, a couple of questions here uh, from other people. So uh, Barbara and Mike were saying how wonderful the photography was. So they really appreciated your talk on the photography. And Ken and Janice said, thank you for the talk. Uh, did you not own a small wood near Kabuki on the Black Isle? They ask. No, not me. Not, not you. No, okay. no. no I, I mean, it's area I know because I'm a botanical reporter for there, but I never owned a wood there. No, not me. Okay, so somebody else is responsible. Um, and John asks, have you detected change in this period that you've owned the woods? Is your has your ownership been long enough? Have you? Yes. Yes, to some degree, uh, the um, going through them in order, the um, the sycamore has become more prevalent, the brownie wood, and I've lost some pines. The pines and larch there don't regenerate at all, so brownie wood is slowly turning into a broadleaf woodland by itself, particularly after this latest wind blow. Actually, uh, Garrick wood, some of the heathy areas are now more heavily whipper tree. The, the pine is regenerating very well there and birch to some degree as well. So that's moved. Um, uh, and the, the tree disease in Tara Wood advanced during my period of ownership. That, that's, that's new. So there have been changes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, th I think um, in, in some places they're uh, saying you should plant uh, um, sycamore to replace ash. Yeah. Um, so it, it's good that you now leave the sycamore yeah, that's right. I mean, sycamore plants itself, actually, it, it, it propagates very well in brownie wood. I mean, it, in, in, in Dam Pond, it was the ash that liked it. And in, in Garrick wood, it's, it's the pine and birch and willow to some extent. Uh, the other things try, uh, uh, but um, some of the other broadleaves get chewed by the deer, I'm afraid, more. They love rowan deer, they really do. And, um, seedlings don't really last. And in, in the northern wood, well, it was lodgepole actually that propagated itself a bit, but um, also birch. Uh, so yes, they, they do self-propagate. And I've never had too much trouble with overgrazing. 
uh, in fact, some more with undergrazing sometimes. I've got roe deer in all of them. Um, and in, in the north, in, in Garrick, I've got red deer as well. So I do have herbivores. Yes, because yes, I know in, in some woods they can be really devastating, but I guess in the more commercial woods that they're, they're a concern because it, you know, spoils the, if you're, oh, not, yeah, if you're, yeah, if you're yeah. not really needing a profit out of your woodlands no. and you can let them, nature take its course. That's right, so yes. Ken and Janet followed up with, um, somebody put an article in the botanical mag and about the, presumably about this uh, woodland near Kabuki because he found twin flower there. Yes, so, actually, we found that originally as recorders. Mm -hmm. We fell over it. Uh, I mean, that's West of Cobo Wood. Uh, but, um, because we were, somebody had asked us to look for them, um, for Othelia secunda for a research project in, in Northern Ireland. And I was directed to the Othelia secunda site there, at Cobokey Wood. And I looked at something just on by the path, goodness me. This was, because twin flowers thought, I, I probably mentioned it, I would have mentioned it in my other lecture I gave before, but twin flowers thought to be extinct at Easter Ross. And Ursula um, Duncan in her floor of Easter Ross said, I'm reluctant to declare it extinct, but actually twin flower, we've now found it at five sites in Easter Ross. And that's, that was the first one. But really quite a surprise. In winter, you often find it best in winter, actually, it's very characteristic leaves. Okay. Well, th thank you very much, Brian. And uh, Erica Beveridge said thank you for your talk. It's very enjoyable. So on behalf of the society, I'd like to thank you for stepping in at this late time and giving us a very interesting talk and beautiful pictures to look at. And I'd like to remind everybody about um, Jonathan Silverton's talk on the 19th of May, which will be followed by the annual meeting. Um, so thank you everybody for uh, coming to the t lecture tonight and especially thanks to Brian for a very interesting talk. Thank you everybody for listening. So good night.